It was on this cold day that he was laid to rest. Saturday, February 27th, 1965. A man who in the 39 years of his life changed the hearts and minds of countless people. His was a stormy life, as was his death. At birth, he was named Malcolm Little. He rose to worldwide attention with the name Malcolm X. He died with the name El Haj Malik El Shabazz. Personal political philosophy is black nationalism. It was on this cold day that he was laid to rest. Saturday, February 27th, 1965. A man who in the 39 years of his life changed the hearts and minds of countless people. His was a stormy life, as was his death. At birth, he was named Malcolm Little. He rose to worldwide attention with the name Malcolm X. He died with the name El Haj Malik El Shabazz. Personal political philosophy is black nationalism, which means that the black man should control the politics of his own community and control the politicians who are in his own community. My personal economic philosophy is uh, also black nationalism, which means that the black man should have a hand in controlling the economy. commanded so much of attention as Malcolm X, who was one of the most electrifying speakers this country has ever produced. Some of the things he said rocked his contemporaries and his adversaries. He developed into what he became from a turbulent childhood. Born in Omaha, Nebraska, raised in Lansing, Michigan, the son of a Baptist preacher who followed Marcus Garvey and was brutally murdered in Malcolm's youth. Malcolm's school ambitions were crushed by a white teacher who told him to be realistic about being a nigger and forget about being a lawyer and learn to do something with his hands instead. And so he floundered. He went to Roxbury, Massachusetts to live with his sister Ella. He flirted with crime. He got a job on the railroad, washing dishes, loading supplies, and selling sandwiches. Working on Pullman trains enabled him to travel to the big cities, Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York. He became intoxicated with life in those big cities. Between rail trips, he bought himself zoot suits with the reed pleat and the stuffed cuff. He conked his hair. He settled in Harlem finally and began associating with a very fast crowd in that town. He started smoking reefers, selling drugs, selling women. He started using cocaine and he developed a habit. He drifted lower and lower and he was finally arrested on a robbery rap. In January of 1946, at 21 years of age, he was sentenced to eight to 10 years in prison. Big Red, as he was known, started his life in the Charlestown State Prison. It was the same year that Jackie Robinson was becoming the first black man to play Major League Baseball, an event that Malcolm and his fellow inmates celebrated behind bars. Malcolm was cold and belligerent in prison. He was soon dubbed Satan. Few would mess with him. But through the visits and letters of one of his brothers, he began to change. He was exposed to the teachings of a little-known man in Detroit named Elijah Mohammed. Malcolm's brother told Malcolm that his predicament was a direct result of one source, the white man. The message was, avoid the white devil and become independent. Clean yourself up. Pick yourself up. Don't smoke. Don't drink. Don't eat pork. Don't fornicate. And especially, be proud of yourself and your past. It prodded young Malcolm to do what he hadn't dreamt of doing for years, read. It was a painful process. He started with the dictionary, literally reading each page. Then grammar books, then novels, textbooks, encyclopedias, history, philosophy, psychology, philology, geography, and on and on, into the night, every night, reading until the wee hours, past lights out. Reading in poor light damaged his eyes to the point that he had to wear glasses for the rest of his life. But he learned, and he grew. When he left prison in 1952, he was completely changed. He had a new perspective and a new attitude. 
as well as a desire to grow in the service of Elijah Mohammed. He dropped his last name, identifying it as a slave name. He replaced it with X, and he joined the Nation of Islam. Within the next two years, a lot happened. The United States Supreme Court handed down its historic Brown decision of 1954. It ruled that separate but equal schooling was inherently unequal and must end with all deliberate speed. And as that momentous verdict was being digested by America, Malcolm was back in the streets of Harlem, but now a minister of the Nation of Islam, assigned here by Elijah Muhammad to open up the nation's seventh temple. Malcolm fished for members at rallies that were being held by other organizations. It was a slow but very sure process. By now it was 1955, the year that the civil rights movement ignited. It began in Montgomery, Alabama with the Rosa Parks incident that spread throughout the nation. A young Baptist preacher at the forefront named the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Picket demonstrations were occurring everywhere in the Southland and attracting heavy media coverage. Meanwhile, the Nation of Islam continued to grow. Malcolm was now Elijah Muhammad's national organizer and spokesman. He organized bazaars to attract new members and raise money. He turned out the first edition of the nation's newspaper, Muhammad Speaks the sale of which brought in more money to develop the growing numbers of temples that were springing up with Malcolm's assistance. Malcolm read voraciously. He haunted bookstores like Louis Michaud's National Memorial African Bookstore, located on 7th Avenue between 125th and 126th Streets. It helped him polish his astounding skills as a public speaker. It was his chief device to recruit members. It also helped him to deal with the news media that had begun to take notice. Abraham Lincoln tricked the so-called Negro into thinking that he was free. And when you uh, read some of the books that were written by the so-called Negro historian J.E. Rogers, one of his books, God, uh, The Africa's Gift to America, he points out plainly how Abraham Lincoln did nothing but trick the Negro, fool the Negro, and use the Negro, the same as every other politician who has been in the White House has been tricking and fooling and using the Negro as a political football ever since America has been America. The picket demonstrations in the South continued to escalate, and so did the development of the Nation of Islam, developing particularly in Harlem, where large crowds were now turning out to hear this fiery young man who had an extraordinary way with words and ideas. He sometimes spoke for hours, extemporaneously, but the attention of a standing crowd never faltered. Our desire, our prayer, that we can have a peaceful, intelligent rally here this afternoon. But at the same time, we see that they have surrounded us with many of their own agents in uniform and out of uniform who have spent much time here in Harlem posing as peace officers and at the same time breaking up the peace of black people. So we hope that they will be peaceful and we will be peaceful. We are here to tell you to love the white man. You have come to the wrong place. And those of you who think that you perhaps came here to hear us tell you to turn the other cheek to the brutality of the white man, I say again, you came to the wrong place. But no matter what happens, we don't teach you to turn the other cheek. We don't teach you to turn the other cheek in the south, and we don't teach you to turn the other cheek in the north. We teach you to obey the law. We teach you to carry yourselves in, in a respectable way. But at the same time, we teach you that anyone who puts his hand on you, do your best to see that he doesn't put it on anybody else. You don't have any dope for airplanes bringing drugs into this country. The white man brings it in. The white man brings it to Harlem. The white man makes you a drug addict. The white man then puts you in jail when he catches you using drugs. Who is it that controls the prostitution in Harlem? It's the white man. Who controls the large sale of whiskey and wine? It's the white man. You don't have any distillery. You don't own Shenley's. You don't own uh, Old Overholt. 
or a Seagram. You don't put the seal on that bottle of whiskey. It's the white man. Who gives you the deck of cards and the dice that you use to gamble with? It's the white man. And after he sell them to you, he catch you with them and push you in jail for using them. We are trapped in a vicious cycle of poverty, of ignorance, of apathy, of disease, and of death. And they have these old Uncle Tom Negro leaders coming to Harlem telling you and me that times are getting better. Your times will never get better until you make them better. We are not the same thing that goes on right here in Harlem. They will, they will let a prostitute die as long as she come back to them later on. They encourage her to be a prostitute. They take bribes from her for being a prostitute. And they'll take it in cash or they'll take it in free. Well, we're here to tell them it has to come to a stop. Anytime you find any white man taking advantage of your woman, disrespecting her, you're within your right to do the same thing to him that he's been doing to you. You can't take a white woman in a white neighborhood. You can't grab a white woman in a white neighborhood. You can't even walk through a white neighborhood with a white woman. Well, what do you look like letting this blue-eyed thing walk around here with our women? Come to biting the enemy of, of America, you'll bite just like that. Whether he tell you to bite in Korea, or bite in Berlin, or bite in the South Pacific. As soon as he say stick them, you'll bite anybody he point the finger at. But right here in this country, right in this country, under your nose, with two-legged white dogs, sticking four-legged dogs on you and my mother, you and I don't know how to bite. Sticking dogs on you and my sister, and you and I don't know how to bite. Sticking dogs on our children and dogs on our babies, and you don't know how to bite. You can't bite nor bark until the white man say bark or bite. In the South, you are segregated by that dog. In the North, you integrated with this dog. And it's no different. I hope you're not getting too wet. Well, the dog is their best friend. The dog is their closest relative. They got the same kind of hair, the same kind of skin, and the same kind of smell. Oh, yeah. And Adam Clayton Powell knows it. He knows you can send him to Washington or you can send him to Puerto Rico. And because he knows it, he speaks with a loud voice like a black man. And when he speaks with a loud voice like a black man, the white man calls him a racist. Says he sounds too much like a Muslim. <laughs> Simply because he's trying to tell the white man where it's at. When the Honorable Elijah Muhammad finishes opening your and my eyes and making it possible for us to see this white man like he really is, he don't have to worry about us integrating with him. We don't want to be around that old pale thing. We don't want to be around that old pale thing. We don't want to integrate with that old pale thing. We don't want to sleep next to that old pale thing. No, we can do without him. You find that old pale thing, lean out in the sun trying to get to look like you. That old pale thing. You find him using man pain, trying to look like you. That old pale thing. That old sickly looking thing. And today we see him like he is. There was a time when we used to drool in the mouth over white people. We thought they were pretty because we were blind. We were dumb. We couldn't see them as they are. But since the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has come and taught us the religion of Islam, which has cleaned us up and made us so we can see for ourselves, 
Now we can see that old pale thing to look exactly as he looked. Nothing but an old pale thing. The news media found Malcolm both frightening and irresistible. He was hit with a constant stream of questions from every quarter on most any subject involving race. He was pitted in several broadcast debates with black leaders and white. Some white reporters, however, learned from listening to Malcolm. This was one of the things that always shook me about Malcolm, is how fundamentally American he was in his outlook and his aspirations, despite his basic quarrel with American society. Because after all, what was his quarrel with American society? His quarrel with American society was the fact that the black man had been excluded from his rightful place. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of small things about Malcolm that was so American. And um, this is something that the white man didn't understand. And after all, all he was asking for was a piece of action for the black man. And the black man to be treated as a human being. And not as a cipher. And this, of course, is what this country is supposed to be all about. Malcolm's fury was directed at the same enemy that Dr. King's movement in the South was attacking, white racism. But they had different ideas about dealing with the violence of whites upon blacks. Well, I made this clear over and over again that my staff is absolutely committed to nonviolence. We have taught it, we have preached it, we have not encouraged violence at any point. We are not stated widely different goals. Dr. King stated the determination to overcome racism and become integrated with white America. Malcolm said the Nation of Islam had opposite desires. We have no desire to integrate with a race of people who are cruel enough to stick dogs on women, children, and babies. Please. We don't want to have anything to do with any race, any race of dogs, two-legged dogs that will stick four-legged dogs on innocent, harmless women, children, and babies. Mass media had by now labeled the Nation of Islam the Black Muslims. When John F. Kennedy became president in 1960, Malcolm had attained national stature. Everywhere the Muslims went, the police were sure to go, with reporters not far behind. They called whites devils. They said they wanted to separate from them and be independent. Muslims openly admitted that many of their number were rehabilitated criminals and drug addicts. All of this made them most intimidating. And yet they were peaceful and law-abiding, taking special pains to be courteous to police. But several police agencies were watching the Muslims closely. The U.S. Justice Department also had them under surveillance. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy admitted it. Well, I would say generally throughout the country, because of the pronouncements of some of their leaders, it's a matter that we are watching uh, for any uh, uh, violation of the law, uh, of the federal law. Uh, it's a matter that is uh, uh, 
being watched at the present time by the Department of Justice. In January of 1963, a few Muslims were arrested while selling newspapers and charged with brutality against police. Malcolm led a quiet vigil outside the Manhattan Criminal Court building at 110 Center Street, and he reiterated his position to the press on their right to self-defense, especially in these violent times. Uh, it's not a case of taking militant action against the police department. As I said earlier, we obey the law. We respect the law more than many of the police officers do. As you, Mr. Muhammad has reformed more uh, lawbreakers. He has re rehabilitated uh, more uh, Negroes with criminal uh, tendencies than the police department itself has. And he, the Muslims in Harlem have done more to bring about respect of law and order than the police department in Harlem has. And I've had police officials in New York City at the top level admit this. So it's not a case of taking militant action against any police. It's a case of letting the police and anyone else who's involved know that we are human beings, we are men, and we will uh, stand like men and defend ourselves like men. I understand that you were riding next to the president's car when the assassination took place. You did not see the person who fired the shot? No, sir. It was back over my right shoulder. In the wake of the tragedy, Malcolm was among the many national figures who were sought after for reactions to the assassination. Malcolm said it was a case of the chickens coming home to roost. Many misinterpreted the remark and were outraged. On December 4, 1963, Elijah Muhammad did something that Malcolm never dreamt would happen. This statement is from Messenger Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Muslims of America. Uh, Minister Malcolm Shabazz addressing a public meeting at Manhattan Center in New York City on Sunday, December 1st, did not speak for the Muslims when he made comments on the death of the president, John F. Kennedy. He was speaking for himself and not Muslim in general. And Minister Malcolm has been suspended from public speaking for the time being. Uh, Mr. Muhammad's correct statement on hearing of the death of the president was as follows. We with the world are very shocked at the assassination of our president. And the nation still mourn the loss of our president. And he has said that it seems that every president who speaks out on behalf of the Negro has been assassinated from Lincoln to President Kennedy. Part of Malcolm's 90-day period of silence was spent in Miami as the personal guest of Cassius Clay as he was then known. Clay was preparing for his fight with heavyweight champion Sonny Liston. Clay would beat Liston and become world champion, and then stunned the world the following day by announcing that he had become a follower of Elijah Muhammad. Soon after, the new champion came to New York and was shown around the United Nations by his friend Malcolm X. By now, the 90-day period was up. Malcolm X, may I call you that? Certainly. Malcolm X, I, uh, I want to talk with you briefly about your affiliation with Cassius. How long have you known him? About three years. And have you been advising him uh, as far as his religious affiliations are concerned? Well, no, I don't give advice to anyone. He's my brother and my friend. I express what I know and understand around him, and then, but he has a mind of his own, an understanding of his own. Did he feel that, uh, he tells me that he felt that his affiliation with the Muslim religion had a great deal to, to do with his winning. Yes, uh, as a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the religion of Islam, it definitely had, uh, had everything to do with his victory. It gave him the confidence that uh, was necessary to be the winner. Malcolm X, you were involved in a controversy some months ago with your leader. Is that over? Well, I've been, I've been silent for the past 90 days because of uh, some statements I made concerning the President of the United States. Uh, which were distorted. They were distorted. And, yes. And, what did you and, say, and, Malcolm? Well, I said the same thing that everybody says, that uh, his assassination was the result of the climate of hate. But only, I, only, only I said the chickens came home to roost, and, which means the same thing. Uh, uh, climate of hate means that this is, this is the result of something. And when I said chickens coming home to roof, I mean, uh, chickens coming home to roof, I said the same thing. But did you, did, you did not say that you were glad the president was killed. No, that's what the press said. Uh -huh. What will I look like saying that I'm glad the president was killed? Malcolm, this is your first public statement in that 90-day period, is it not? First time I opened up my mouth in 90 days. That's why I'm talking so fast and so hearty. <laughs> <laughs> you, feel, you feel, however, that uh, that we're making progress in, in this country no, and worldwide? No, no, no. Uh, I will never say that progress is being made. If you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, there's no progress. Mm -hmm. If you pull it all the way out, that's not progress. The progress is healing the wound that the blow, that the blow made. 
and they haven't even begun to pull a knife out, much less try and pull, uh, heal the wound. You have, have you have? They won't even admit the knife is there. <laughs> you have any <laughs> prediction you'd like to make? No, Mr. when we'll solve this. Cassius makes all the predictions. But there was no word from split. Chicago, Malcolm uh, said. Uh, everything I and know, as the days wore on, Malcolm I, came to a uh, momentous but, decision. Uh, during the 90 days that I've been silent, I have come to the conclusion that uh, I can best help spread the solution that the, and the diagnosis that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad gives of the so-called Negro problem in this country by continuing to remain out of the nation of Islam and working on my own without restriction in the way that I think I best know how. Soon after Malcolm went to Africa, he saw the validity of the teachings of the late Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey taught the value in relating to one's land of origin. We didn't want anybody to tell us anything about Africa, much less call us an African. Uh, and, and, uh, and in hating Africa and hating the African, we ended up even hating ourselves without even realizing it. Because you can't hate the roots of a tree and not hate the tree. You can't hate your origin and not end up hating yourself. You can't hate Africa and not hate yourself. And you show me one of these people over here who have been thoroughly brainwashed, who has a negative attitude toward Africa, and I'll show you one that has a negative attitude toward himself. Malcolm also made his Hajj, the trip to the holy city of Mecca. There he received an Islamic name, El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. He was also shocked to see Muslims who were white but not racists. Malcolm traveled extensively in Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, Uganda, Kenya, Liberia, Senegal, delivering countless fiery speeches, telling the African about the plight of the Afro-American. Malcolm noticed that he was being followed. His words elicited strong reaction among Africans. Many African delegates began quoting Malcolm in UN debates, much to the embarrassment of America. He made two trips to Africa that year, and though his concern still centered on blacks in America, he was now seeing the problem in international context. Malcolm, what is your purpose here? Well, my purpose here is to remind the uh, African heads of the state that there are 22 million of us in America who are also of African descent. And to remind them also that we are the victims of uh, America's colonialism or American imperialism. And that our problem is not an American problem, it's a human problem. It's not a Negro problem. It's a problem of humanity. It's not a problem of civil rights, but a problem of human rights. And what do you hope for from this conference? Well, we hope to uh, bring pressure upon them, or rather we hope to impress upon them the importance of their bringing pressure and world opinion upon the United States to take some meaningful effort to solve our problem in America. We want them to help us get our problem before the United Nations and charge America with violating our human rights in the same way that South Africa is charged with violating the human rights of our people in that area. And what uh, sort of reaction have you been getting from the African leaders? Well, I've gotten a good reaction, a very sympathetic reaction, and an understanding reaction. Many of them have been misinformed by the American government into thinking that uh, black people in America don't identify with Africa, and therefore they've restrained themselves from voicing uh, their interest in our problem. But I've, I've impressed upon them that our problem is their problem as well as their problems are our problem. When he returned, he found that the news that he had a new perspective had beaten him back home, and the press was waiting for him to explain. Uh, when I was in on the pilgrimage, I had close contact with Muslims whose skin would in America be classified as white and with Muslims who were themselves would be classified as white in America. But these particular Muslims didn't call themselves white. They looked upon themselves as human beings, as part of the human family, and therefore they looked upon all other segments of the human family as part of that same family. Well, now, uh, they had a different look or a different air or a different attitude than that which is uh, reflected in the uh, attitude of the man in America who calls himself white. So I said that if uh, Islam had done this, done that for them, perhaps if the white man in America would study Islam, perhaps they could do the same thing for him. But Malcolm's split with the nation of Islam was causing more and more problems. On June 15, 1964, he went to Queen's Court to fight an attempt by the Muslims to evict him from the house he and his wife and family had lived in for several years. When he left the hearing, he was heavily guarded by his own followers and plainclothes police. Frankly. Uh, it has been a uh, well-known fact 
uh, though only in the form of rumor, that uh, there has been a great deal of uh, apprehension at my being out of the black Muslim movement on the part of the black Muslims themselves. And I had uh, stated in a newspaper article about an effort to take my life back in January, and at that time the Muslims denied it. In fact, they tried to make it appear to my brother that I was insane. But on a program in Chicago called Hotline, that's moder moderated by Wesley South, John Ali, the national secretary, admitted, uh, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday, one of these days last week, that they absolutely were going to kill me. Why are they threatening your life? Well, uh, Primarily because they're afraid that I will tell the real reason that they've been that I'm out of the black Muslim movement Which I never told I kept to myself But the real real reason is that Elijah Muhammad the head of the movement is the father of eight children by six different teenage girls different uh, six different teenage girls who were his private personal secretary uh, four of them had one child apiece by him uh, two of them had two children, and one of those two is pregnant right now in Los Angeles, uh, where they're his thir uh, third child. And uh, the, the one who first made me aware of this was Wallace Muhammad, Mr. Muhammad's son. And it was uh, their fear that uh, if I remained in the black Muslim movement, and this came into the knowledge of his followers, that they would leave him and follow me. So uh, a, a plan immediately was set in motion to uh, take me down, put me out, and uh, the statement that I allegedly made, or not that I allegedly made, I did make it, the statement that I made about Kennedy was used as a, a pretext to take me down. But in reality, it was, the, it was because I had come to New York and told Joseph, the captain in New York, and uh, the secretary and the minister in Boston about these children that Mr. Muhammad had. And it was that, that right there was the real reason for my being out of the movement. Did what you get steps out of the will you take to protect yourself from this threat? I take no steps. I have a rifle. If anybody comes to my house without a good reason, I, I intend to try and use it. Uh, and that's all. A few days later, Congress passed the Civil Rights Bill barring discrimination in education. Malcolm had this reaction in the schoolyard of IS-201 in Harlem. I'm going to use to prove that you can uh, use new legislation and change the conditions that our people face in the South. So instead of legislation, in my opinion, it takes education. The, the whites have to be re-educated uh, so that the racism that they have in their heart can be eliminated and, the, and our people have to be re-educated uh, so that we will know how to do something for ourselves instead of waiting for others to do it for us all the time. Well, how will that re-education be brought about? Uh, well, just as uh, uh, in, the, in World War II, this country could use its uh, news media to propagandize and make, our, make the whole American public uh, love, the, love the Germans and the Japanese, rather love the Russians and the Chinese and hate the Germans and the Japanese. And then after the war, they changed it and made the American public love the, uh, the Germans and love the Japanese, hate the Russians and hate the Chinese which shows that they can make the American public love whom they will and hate whom they will. And that same process can be used to re-educate the American public and show white people how to love black people and show black people how to do something to stand on our own feet and solve our own problems. The black man doesn't have to be taught to love the white man. The white man has to be taught to love the black man. Or at least, do you think the Civil Rights Bill, uh, when it's passed, uh, is a sign of better times for Negroes in this country? No. Uh, as I said before, the legislation won't solve our problem. New York City has all of the laws. It has FEPC. And still, there's job discrimination in this city. Uh, laws doesn't solve, that, that, that type of law doesn't solve the problem. Uh, and it's the same with education. It actually, it's the same, it's the same with the segregated educational system. Uh, it's, it exists here the same as it exists in the South. Now, the law here is on the side of an integrated school system, but you still don't have an integrated school system. What do you think of Senator Goldwater's stand on the Civil Rights Bill? Well, he's probably being more honest than uh, the other politicians are. He's, even though uh, his stand is the wrong stand, and, and it's uh, an unjust stand, still he's being more honest than the other white politicians are. I don't think that uh, in, in his heart, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson's stand is any different from Goldwater's stand. Lyndon B. Johnson is taking a stand that is for political expediency. And it's the same with all of the so-called liberal element. It's political expediency, politics.
As the winter of 1964 began, Malcolm kept up a brutal pace, speaking at scores of colleges, traveling from state to state, and developing his two organizations at the same time. Outside Barnard College, en route to making a speech, he was asked about the Muslims. He says there are probably less than 7,000 members now in the Muslim. Well, it has uh, fallen apart. Uh, thank you. It has fallen apart. And dissatisfied black Americans are now free to participate into the full swing of the struggle that's going on in this country, and I think it will be inclined to step up the tempo. Are they in your movement? Sure. Every movement. <laughs> on February 4, 1965, Malcolm came to Selma, Alabama, in the thick of Dr. King's voter registration drive. Dr. King had just received the Nobel Peace Prize in December, but he was arrested in this Marion County drive. Dr. King, the apostle of peace, would die violently in four years. Malcolm was invited to speak at Brown's Methodist Church in Selma by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Mrs. Coretta King spoke and sat next to Malcolm at the dais. She said later that Malcolm told her that he wanted to work with, not against, her husband. Then Malcolm addressed the audience. You have to read the history of slavery to understand this. There were two kinds of Negroes. There was that old house Negro and the field Negro. Hold the light high. And the house Negro always looked out for his master. When the field Negroes got too much out of line, he held them back in check. He put them back on the plantation. Like people like me. Talk to the slaves. They didn't kill them. They sent some old house Negro along behind him to undo what he said. Because he lived better than the field Negro. He ate better, he dressed better, and he lived in a better house. He lived right up next to his master in the attic or the basement. He ate the same food his master ate and wore his same clothes. And he could talk just like his master. Master, good diction. And he loved his master more than his master loved himself. That's why he didn't want his master hurt. If the master got sick, he'd say, what's the matter, boss? We sick? He was <laughs> when the master's house caught a fire, he'd try and put the fire out. He didn't want his master's house burned. He never wanted his master's property threatened. And he was more defensive of it than the master was. That was the house Negro. But then you had some field Negro who lived in huts, had nothing to lose. They wore the worst kind of clothes. They ate the worst food. And they caught hell. They felt the sting of the lash. They hated their master. Oh, yes, they did. If the master got sick, they prayed that the master died. <laughs> if the master's house caught a fire, they prayed for a strong wind to come along. <laughs> this was the difference between the two. And today you still have house Negroes and field Negroes. <laughs> I'm a field Negro. If I can't live in the house as a human being, I'm praying for a wind to come along. If the master won't treat me right and he's sick, I'll tell the doctor to go in the other direction. <laughs> but if all of us are going to live as human beings, as brothers, then I'm for a society of human beings that can practice brotherhood. To investigate such as the Klan, then you and I are within our rights to wire Secretary General Ustam of the United Nations and charge the federal government in this country behind was being derelict in its duty to protect the human rights of 22 million black people in this country. And in, and in their failure to protect our human rights, they are violating the United Nations Charter, and they are not qualified to continue to sit in that international body and talk about what human rights should be done in other countries on this earth. But before I sit down, I want to thank you for listening to me. I hope I haven't put anybody on the spot. I'm not intending to try and stir you up and make you do something that you wouldn't have done anyway. <laughs> I pray that God will bless you in everything that you do. I pray that you will grow intellectually so that you can understand the problems of the world and where you fit into in that world picture. And I pray that all the fear that has ever been in your heart will be taken out. And when you look, when you look at that man, if you know he's nothing but a coward, you won't fear him. If he wasn't a coward, he wouldn't gang up on him. He wouldn't need to fear him. His 
East Elmhurst house was bombed 10 days later on February 14th. He and his family were asleep when the bomb struck at 2.15 a.m. Miraculously, they all got out of the house unharmed. No one was ever caught for the deed. Malcolm had eight days to live. He raised his hand in uh, a Muslim greeting. So, Salam Aleikum. At that point, uh, I, I heard a rumbling behind me. And I'm sure everyone else did too. And I turned around in my seat to, to see what it was. And uh, then we saw, like I saw two guys standing up. And the next thing, my next impression, it all happened very rapidly as you can understand, is of the gunshots. And uh, I saw Malcolm had his hand up. He had said, he said, stay cool, stay calm, or something like that. And uh, just then the gunfire went off and his, his hand was up. I remember this, I turned around quickly and the next thing I saw was Malcolm falling back in a dead faint. Um, right after that, of course, like everybody else, you know, chairs were being knocked over, there were screams, uh, everybody was in a mad confusion. I dove for the floor and scrambled behind a rampart on the side. My first impression was, of course, as a reporter, as you know, to get to a telephone and file my story. And I started crawling uh, towards the back of the auditorium, and, and uh, oh, I incidentally saw a guy running out or evidently one of the perpetrators running out and uh, he was shooting like a cowboy all over the place and of course the, uh, the, the shots were going off wildly and after that there was, there was pandemonium in the place. Well, we have two suspects in custody now. Well, Where were the they arrested? Who fired the shot? I wouldn't know that at this time. <laughs> Where were they arrested, sir? One of uh, these men uh, was arrested uh, on the street by one of our patrolmen close by. There were no police at this meeting, were there, Inspector? There were no uniformed policemen assigned inside this hall. What about the skirmish that apparently took place before? What has that got to do with the apparent killing? It might have been a diversionary tactic. The next day, Betty Shabazz claimed her husband's body at the New York Medical Examiner's office. She was escorted by Percy Sutton, their family lawyer. What about, well, the organization, what about the organization, Sister Betty? Do you, do you feel that, uh, it was, that Malcolm had set it up well enough for it to carry on? Will they have a counselor who will take his place? Do you have any idea now? Well, at present, I'd rather not make any comments about the organization or Muslim Mosque Incorporated. I know it's a little personal, but you have the children to, to consider now. And yes. What, what, do you, what can you see for it now? Any, any plans at this time? Now, may I just interrupt you to say that, yes, she has children now. She has four. Yes. The interesting thing is that she is now in the first month of a new pregnancy yes. as well. Mm -hmm. And I think you ought to know also that striking back to the question of the bombing of his house, yes. he not only was without insurance, was without any money at all. Didn't yes. he try to say that he was getting money from uh, China and places of that sort, which yes. was ridiculous? What it's are your plans, then, for the, for the future? It's rather ironic that you had planned to meet with him this coming Friday, have you, Mr. Fact, Sutton? Malcolm was to make a will this Friday, mm -hmm. yes. Thank you very much, M Mrs. Thank Shabazz. You. Thank you. In Chicago, police kept Elijah Muhammad under heavy guard. We had, uh, had not, as I say, never uh, resorted to no such thing as violence. The uh, way I see it, uh, Malcolm uh, is the victim of his own preaching. He preached violence, and so he became the victim of it. Would you say flatly that no black Muslims were involved in the shooting of Malcolm X? I wasn't there, but I don't believe that any of my followers was there. It had nothing to do with it at all. Because we don't even know this person. Who do you think uh, might have done it then? Who would have had reason? I don't know. I have <laughs> no knowledge of it. Are you in fear of your own life? No, sir. At 2 o'clock that Monday night, a fire ripped through the Harlem Mosque Number no. 7 at 116th Street and Lenox Avenue. The mosque was under police guard, but no one was seen. No one was captured for committing the act. Well, about 2.15 a.m., a terrific muffle explosion occurred, at uh, which time the, uh, the glass was blown out onto the street, and the fire started on the fourth floor of 102, West on 16th Street. The executive director of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Roy Wilkins, visited the White House that following day and discussed the murder of Malcolm X with President Johnson. 
Did you talk to the president about the feud between the black Muslims and the black nationalists? No, we didn't discuss that, although there was a passing reference to uh, who might have killed Malcolm X, but it was very passing and very brief. Could you give us your feeling on that feud, sir? Well, I don't know about it. Uh, all I can say is that it appears to be, from what the New York City police have uncovered thus far, it appears to be a feud within the Muslim movement. Now, it might not be. And it's too early uh, yet uh, to, for me to make a statement, since I'm not a captain of detectives or anything of that sort. Or else do you think it might be? Well, it's been suggested that there might be some um, international intrigue here because of Malcolm's travels to the Far East, his contacts with Nasser, his contacts in Africa. I don't know. I, I didn't know about uh, Malcolm X's travels. I don't know what he said to the people. I don't know what alliances he might have had. So I don't feel competent to say that there was an international flavor to this thing. To me, it appears to be a quarrel within the Muslim group. James Farmer, head of the Congress of Racial Equality, had this comment about the murder. Mr. Farmer, what makes you say that Malcolm X's murder was an international conspiracy? Well, I think that it had international implications. I understand that Malcolm X made an attempt last week to contact the State Department about a plot against his life. I cannot imagine his seeking to contact the State Department unless he thought that the plot had international implications. Do you feel that the black Muslims were in any way responsible for his death? I uh, have no belief that the black Muslims were responsible in any way for Malcolm X's death. Do you have any theory of why he was murdered or how? No, I am urging, however, that the federal government launch an investigation into all the circumstances surrounding his murder. I think that the answers to the many questions raised should come out of that inquiry. Harlem was shaken by Malcolm's death. Several stores were closed in tribute. Police were on patrol everywhere, expecting violence. Everyone was asking the same question in the community, who killed Malcolm? The question is still hanging. On February 26th, a Friday, Norman 3X Butler was arrested and charged with Malcolm's murder. Thomas 15X Johnson would be arrested the next week, March 3rd. Both were connected with the black Muslims. Both were not arrested at the scene of the crime. The only man who police did arrest at the scene was in fact caught by Malcolm's followers who grabbed Thomas Hagen, also known as Talmadge Hayer, and nearly beat him to death out in the street in front of the Audubon Ballroom. It was then that police stepped in and took Hagen into custody. All three were convicted and sentenced to life on April 15, 1966. They would be eligible for parole only after serving a minimum of 26 years, eight months. But to this day, many ask, where were the police that day Malcolm was killed? And this reporter joins in that question. Why was he guarded so loosely when police knew full well, as everybody knew, that Malcolm's life was in great danger? Malcolm himself had repeatedly told police that his life was in jeopardy. Malcolm also had doubts toward the end that the Muslims were stalking him. In fact, this reporter has been told by at least two people close to Malcolm that Malcolm told them that the Central Intelligence Agency would kill him. The CIA was indeed very closely watching Malcolm. Of special concern was his effectiveness in Africa. He had submitted an eight-page memorandum to a meeting of the heads of 33 African nations calling for their support in his pending move to take America before the United Nations for violating the Afro-Americans' human rights. In view of America's heavy economic interests in Africa, there can be no doubt that such a move, successful or not, would have been most embarrassing to this country and would have certainly injured the huge investments of countless American big businesses in Africa. Malcolm's speeches in Africa had a devastating impact. Several U.S. ambassadors complained. U.S. officials tried to have him barred from speaking in Kenya and several other African nations. And what of Malcolm's talks with King Fazal, the czar of the world's oil supply? How much influence did Malcolm's words have on what is happening today? In the interest of justice and truth, the following questions must be answered. Why was Malcolm almost fatally poisoned while he was in Africa? And who did it? Why was Malcolm forbidden entry to France? And what American influence was behind that? Who bombed Malcolm's house? 
And why has no one been caught? Why were police so lax, almost casual, in their actions that fateful day at the Audubon Ballroom? Eyewitnesses to the murder say that there were more than three assailants. Why haven't they been sought or caught? And who burned the mosque? Why hasn't anyone been caught for that deed? In view of disclosures recently of criminal actions by the United States government and the police, from the office of the president on down, nationally and internationally, it is not at the least unreasonable to demand answers to these questions. At 20 minutes after 9, Saturday morning, February 27th, the Faith Temple of God in Christ on Amsterdam Avenue and 150th Street opened its doors for the funeral of El Haj Malik El Shabazz. Relatively few of the 6,000 persons who were estimated there could get into the church. Ossie Davis, a friend of Malcolm's, delivered the eulogy. Here, at this final hour, in this quiet place, Harlem has come to bid farewell to one of its brightest hopes, extinguished now and gone from us forever. For Harlem is where he worked and where he struggled and fought. There are those who will consider it their duty as friends of the Negro people to tell us to revile him, to flee even from the presence of his memory, to save ourselves by writing him out of the history of our turbulent times. Many will ask what Harlem finds to honor in this stormy, controversial, and bold young captain, and we will smile. Many will say, turn away, away from this man, for he is not a man, but a demon, a monster, a subverter, and an enemy of the black man. And we will smile. They will say that he is of hate, a fanatic, a racist, who can only bring evil to the cause for which you struggle. And we will answer and say unto them, Did you ever talk to Brother Malcolm? Did you ever touch him or have him smile at you? Did you ever really listen to him? Did he ever do a mean thing? Was he ever himself associated with violence or any public disturbance? For if you did, you would know him. And if you knew him, you would know why we must honor him. Malcolm was our manhood, our living black manhood. This was his meaning to his people. And in honoring him, we honor the best in ourselves. However much we differed with him or with each other about him and his value as a man, let his going from us serve only to bring us together now. Consigning these mortal remains to earth, the common mother of all, secure in the knowledge that what we place in the ground is no more now a man, but a seed, which, after the winter of discontent, will come forth again to meet us, and we shall know him then for what he was and is, a prince, our own black shining prince, who did not hesitate to die because he loved us so. Anytime you beg another man to set you free, you will never be free. Freedom is something that you have to do for yourself. Just like the white man in America brought about freedom for himself by uh, letting the uh, people who oppressed him and colonized him know that he was willing to pay the price. And until the American Negro lets the white man know that we are really, really ready and willing to pay the price that is necessary for freedom, our people will always be walking around here second-class citizens or what you call 20th century slaves. What price are you talking about, sir? The price of freedom is death.